Hallelujah. Lord, you are our God, and we are your people, and we are here to hear from you tonight. It seems like uh, the calendar never stops. The weekend's always upon us. I guess we could call it a little bit of a routine, couldn't we? Lord, we don't want to fall into a routine. We want to not come because it's when we're supposed to come. We want to come with expectation that we're going to hear from you. So we open up our ears now and ask that you would speak truth into our life so that we could worship you with our entire being. So Lord, right now we will willfully lay down any and all distractions that we would have power over and choose to set our eyes afresh on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the star-breathing God. All wisdom and knowledge is in you. And so, Lord, we would be foolish and amiss if we didn't turn our ears to you now to listen to what you'd have to say to us. Lord, not only do we want to lower down our guard and let you in, but we would wrestle right now with the resistance that we would normally put up to your word, because sometimes it's hard. So we would ask that you'd help us to lower that wall that you'd come wrestle with us and win and that we would submit to you now with lasting effect not just in the moment but forever changed by your spirit and your word that's what we would ask if that's your prayer just let them know it's good to see everybody sort of can't really see you. Oh, there you are. Hi. How's everybody? Doing good? Awesome. Good, good, good. I want to uh, ask you to please open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. I want to say hello to everybody that's joining us on Facebook. And uh, I don't know where you are in this world, but I know some people are watching from different parts of the country. So uh, welcome. Thank you for being part of our extended family. And, of course, if there's anything that we could do as a church to bless and help you, uh, please let us know, and we'll do our very best to do so. So as you're turning your attention to Matthew chapter 5, and I hope that you are, don't just uh, listen to me. Uh, Grab a copy of God's Word and open it up to Matthew 5. And as you're going, I just want to kind of catch you up a little bit. Uh, Tonight is going to be the the, the second part of, um, I thought it was going to be a, (laughs) I thought it was going to be a one-part message. This whole beatitude thing, you know, blessed are those, blessed are those. And I thought I could get through it in in one day and then go to the next section of scripture, only to find out that we've been in this study now for about four weeks and I haven't even got through the fourth verse yet. And so, but it's just filled with all kinds of stuff. I hope you love God's word and I hope that you're uh, learning from it and appreciate God's word. Uh, Do you appreciate God's word? You do? Awesome. I do too. And uh, it's good to see everyone here who appreciates God's word. Uh, this is going to be the second, uh, the second part of, and I'm not even going to say the, the, the second half, but the second part of this happy people message. And uh, we're going to study on um, what, what, makes us, what makes a person happy. How do we get there? And we all agree that we want to be happy. No one would ever stand up and say, hey, I want to be miserable today. And uh, if you are, that's you. That's, you're not in the right place. Uh, We're not going after that tonight. We're going after joy and happiness and blessing. Amen. And so last week we talked, we started talking about happy people. We started talking about the blessed are those who, and what Jesus was doing was he's defragging our spiritual hard drive, right? He's taking the things we think of that normally would be in the kind of like the bad column, and he's switching them over to the good column. He wants to give you a new reality, right? He wants to give you a new reality, a new way to think about things. And so uh, that's, we talked about humility and your desire to, 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 to um, 
lay down your own pride and realize that you have a need for Jesus, not just to be saved, but in all facets of life. And so most people don't like to lay down the authority of their life. That's not fun, right? And no one likes to mourn. Like, mourning is not fun. Man, I just hope someone I love dies today so I can be miserable for the next two weeks. Like, nobody is doing that. And nobody's, no one's excited about humbling themselves under the mighty hand of God. They might talk about a good game and say, it's good to be humble, but most people aren't really, really good at that. And so Jesus is like, yeah, I want you to take these things that normally people don't drift toward, and I want you to take them from that column, which is perceived as bad, and I want you to put them over into the good column, and you'll find happiness there. And I hope that blessed you. Now, uh, this week, we're going to start this Happy People Part 2. And guess what next week's title is going to be? And we'll see if you guys are really smart. What do you think it's going to be? Wow, you guys are a brilliant bunch. And, and so let me, let me do, let me do, a, fa- do you a favor. I want to I wanna take you back to your, to your childhood a little bit in Happy People Part 2. And... Um, this is, this is not my little comfort thing. This is not so my security blanket while I'm preaching. I don't like normally have this up here. And um, no, I have my own at home. His name is E-Bear. But um, this guy right here, this is, this is the little teddy bear. So the reason why I brought this out is because, um, and maybe you guys have done this too, a couple weeks ago we, we played the hot cold game at my house. You guys know what the hot cold game is? Right? Yeah, hot cold game. You know, you, 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 you take this. This is what we took this teddy bear for. And, and the kids go into the other room, and they hide their eyes, and you hide it somewhere, right? And then you go, and you sit down, okay, come on, and they come out, and they go look, frantic, going through the house as if this was like a pot of gold, and they go looking for that thing, right? And they're running around the house, and they're going here, and they're going there, and you're going, hot, hot, cold, cold, hot, you know what I'm talking about now, right? Has everybody played that game before? You've all played that game, played it many times. Okay, so, so here, here's the thing. I think that for many people, um, this, the hidden object, God's your hidden object. God's your hidden object. And truth be known, if you're playing the, 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 the hidden object game, cold, 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 cold. Okay? Cold, cold, cold. And, and, and many don't experience supreme blessing. That's what, that's what the Beatitudes are. They're, they're supreme, supreme blessing. They're uh, fortunate, uh, well, well off, and, and happy. And a lot of people aren't experiencing all that because their pursuit of God is cold, 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 right? And what, listen, one cold or two cold might be proximity, you know? If you're not close to the thing, you're cold, right? But, but when, you, when you slow down your looking, then it's cold, 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 cold. Listen, Jackson's four. And I love my son. When we play this game, if he finds that thing right away, awesome. He's all happy, right? But as soon as it gets a little tough and Daddy hit it in a, in a harder place and, and some seconds and minutes start to tick on the clock, right? It goes from hot, 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 hot to warm and cool and cold and cold and cold. And finally he just, what? No, he gives up. He gives up, and, and, and I think that's us. That's us. And, um, you know, it's funny. We were talking the last couple of weeks about uh, Jesus going up onto the mountain, right? Red wall, red letter. Let's, let's ascend the mountain of the Lord. That's where God meets with his people. And, 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 and the people were challenged to come up the mountain, right? And it's really, really funny. I noticed something that when, when Jesus said to, to these people, uh, I want you to come up the mountain, right? Most of the people didn't go, did they? Most of the people didn't go. The disciples went. But you know what's really, really funny? <laughs> when I hide this, the kids know what it is. This is what they're looking for. When the disciples were to asked to come up the mountain, they didn't know what the hidden object was, did they? They didn't know. They didn't know what Jesus was going to teach. They didn't know if Jesus was going to do something or give them something, right? He blessed people all the time with food and healing. They didn't know what he was going to do. They didn't know about what miracle he was going to perform. We do, because we get to read it now, don't we? So we're blessed people, amen? But they didn't know. The disciples didn't know what Jesus was going to to give. 
what, what miracle he was going to perform, but they did know this. A real disciple knows that faithful, consistent, constant, obedient following of God is always best if you want God's best. And that's why some people decided not to go up and never got this message. And some people did, and they got it. They found their object. And so we talked about putting a ring on Jesus and committing to following and obeying him all the time, even when it's difficult, that always brings God's best results, right? How many people honestly could say that they specifically saw something in Scripture and they were like, I know what it says, and I did it, and I resent it, and I regret it. Anybody? They did, you did what the Bible said to do, and it was a mistake? Come on. God's batting a thousand, isn't he? Right? If, 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 if he says to do something, and we specifically do it, we will never resent that. We will never, ever regret that, will we? A hundred out of a hundred times. But almost the same stat, I would say 99 out of a hundred. Do you agree that even though the result was awesome, it wasn't what you expected? It was never the way you thought it was going to be. And that's what happened here with the guys going up onto the mountain. I don't know what the result is going to be. I don't know what God is going to do, but I know it's going to be good, so I'm going to keep on keeping on. I've set my face like stone, determined to do his will because he's a good father, and all good things come from him. And so I continue to follow him, even if I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. And we should never say, I'll do it if I know it's going to work out. If I know what's going to happen, then I'll do it. When all the while, you know from all of your years of following him, it never worked out the way you thought, but it was always good. So why are we asking? Why are you asking, Lord, if I knew what was going to happen, then, well, then, I'd, then I'd do it. His word says that all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose, right? Called to his purpose. It brings to mind, when I was a kid, it's different na nowadays, right? But when I was a kid, at sundown, at dusk, remember when the street lights went on? And what did you hear? Scott! Moses! Right, you better be close, because when Mama calls, you know it's best if you come, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Am I the only old person up in here? You remember those days, right? You knew that the call, it was always best to follow your calling, didn't you? And it's, the, it's best to follow the calling of God. And I think most Christians are not fully enjoying the happy that God wants them to enjoy because your pursuit is warm, cold, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, 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 cold. I think that's why. I think that's why. You have to beg people to come to church? Is it because God wasn't ready to meet them? Have, have you ever come to church and been disappointed and God didn't meet you there? Do I always hear from people, hey man, and no credit to me or any other pastor that you've ever said this to, that he was reading your mail? I wasn't reading nothing. I don't even know where y'all live. God met you there. But yet, for some reason, you've got to beg him to come back the next week. Wait a minute, this God that you can't see sees you, and he met you right where you're at, and you don't want to come back again? Are you crazy? No, no, the problem isn't that God, there's a deficiency in God's willingness to show up and meet you. It's, the problem is in your deficiency. That's the problem. So, <clears throat> look at the, so we've done three Beatitudes, and here's the fourth one. Look what it says. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, depending on your translation, for righteousness or justice. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? They'll be satisfied, or as Lori's New Bible says, they will be filled. They will be filled. So you know what comes to mind now? Golden Corral. Don't look at me like I'm a sinner. You guys go there too. We see you there. 
Let me ask you a question. If you went to Golden Corral and paid your nine bucks and they gave you a little bowl of green beans and said, have a nice day, are you going to go home afterwards and go, oh, man, I have a food baby inside of me. Time for a nap. You going to do that? Are you going to do that if you go in and you pay your nine or ten bucks and they, like, let's just forget the, the stupid salad bar. That's, that's blasphemy. I don't even, why do they even put that in a golden corral? I don't even know. Right? So, but if you go there and you pay your ten bucks and you get a little, and that's it. Are you going to walk out of there satisfied and filled? No, you, know, you go to Golden Corral with some expectations, y'all, right? I'm going to kill this thing. I'm getting my money's worth, right? I want to walk out with a food coma. Is there anything else you need? Yes, a wheelbarrow. Right? I mean, I'm not the only one cracking these jokes, right? Y'all do it too, right? You know what I'm talking about. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they'll be satisfied. They're going to be happy because they're going to be satisfied. You know what you want, and you get it, and then you're satisfied. You're not going to be happy if you go in and pay your money and you walk out hungry. No one's going to be satisfied with that, right? Why? Because you're not filled. Because you're not filled. Happy are those. You're going to be happy when you actually get what you're going for, right? And so what we have to ask is what is it we're going for and how do we get it, right? How, what are we going for? And how do we get it? Well, I was thinking about this, that um, what, what, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? What are we looking for? So I was thinking, you know, there's only really three categories of things that people ask God for. Generally speaking, it's this. It's, it's, it's something for me, right? I need something. I'm in, a, I'm in a desperate situation. I need some help. I need deliverance. I need a blessing. I need favor. I need provision. I need something, right? There's that. And is there anything wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that at all, is there? Um, and then we pray for people that we love and care for. Hey, my friend is sick. Uh, my, 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 my girlfriend, uh, she needs a job. And, and, and my, my buddy, he's got some issues in his marriage. And, and Lord, would you help them with that? And that, so we pray for for him to help people that we love. And then there's the, there's, there's the big one. It's, it's the, do something in this crazy world, God, right? Do something. Make things better, please, right? Generally speaking, all of our prayers fall into these three categories. Something for me, some, something for someone that I care for, or fix this crazy world. So here, here this, is gonna be a ma- this is a major defrag for me. It's a major defrag of your spiritual hard drive right now for you, okay? And whether it's, whatever your translation is, whether it's um, hungering and craving for justice or for righteousness, it doesn't matter. I want justice! I want justice! Right? Familiar expression. Um, personally. Someone hurts you. Somebody takes something from you that's not theirs, and, it's, and, and, and you feel cheated and harmed and... And, and taken advantage of, and, and so I want to ju- get them, God, get them, right? You've all felt it. I feel it all the time. So we have this need for, we cry out for justice personally, and, and sometimes it's um, nationally, you know, like, man, are you watching the news? Do you see what's going on? Do you see the violence? Do you see the shooting? Do you see the political correctness? Do you see the this? Do you see, God, help our country! Get prayer back in school! Right? We cry for national justice. Sometimes we cry out for international justice, you know? That nation over there, do you, do you see what they're doing to their people? And do you see the, the sex slave? And you see the starvation and the oppression? And there's an evil dictator and they're killing people. And God, do something over there. Fix this thing. You get that too, right? Common. Um, it's nothing new, man. Everyone thinks that everything is so bad now. This is the worst it's ever been. I would just venture to say and offer this that it's not even close. Not even close. Do me a favor and, and turn with me into uh, the book of Psalm uh, 13, chapter 13, Psalm 13. Look at the first four verses here. This is David, King David. Um, just turn there and 
let's just see if this is something new. Is it? This is going to be a major defrag for some people. And you're not going to like it. I can tell you that right now, you're not going to like it. Psalm 13, look what it says here. Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? This is personal, right? I, I, someone's done something to me. They're after me. They're hurting me. I'm a good guy. But look. Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? I mean, that's an insult to God, isn't it? Think about it. You're telling God he forgot you, like somehow you slipped his mind? Honesty, though, and I think that that's a good lesson for us all. We don't have to, like, come to God with all these, like, formal King James structured prayers. Like, is this King James structured? God, have you forgotten me? Like, just come honestly before the Lord, right? Just come honestly and talk to him. Cry out to him. Oh, Lord, how long, how Lord... Oh, Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O oh Lord, my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. You see how down and defeated he is? I'll tell you one thing, though. It didn't stop him from praying, did it? It didn't stop him at all. It pushed him to prayer. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying, we've defeated him. Ha, ha, ha. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. What was David looking for? What was he looking for? One word, justice. He was looking for justice, wasn't he? He's a good guy, he's doing the right things, and things are not going well for him, and he wants God to intervene. I want justice. I'm the good guy. That's the bad guy. Come to my rescue. I want justice. Um, look at the uh, Old Testament prophet uh, Habakkuk. I think I have the, the um, do I have, yeah, look at the page number on your screen. If you don't, that's actually a book in the Bible. I know most people don't even know that, but uh, Old Testament prophet Habakkuk, he's what, one of the minor prophets, not because his message wasn't important, just because of the length of his book. So it's called a minor versus the major ones like Isaiah. But um, Habakkuk said this. He says, uh, this is the message that Habakkuk received in a vision. He says, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? Sounds, sounds very familiar, doesn't it? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. Do you, do you see, there's a national problem here, right? There's a national problem. Isn't it like that in our country? Like, what happened to our country? Where's our moral values? Where's the family? Where's the moral majority? This is not, it's a free-for-all. Everyone does whatever they want in their own eyes. Morality's in the tank. God, can you help? Look around, man. Look at the TV. Violence. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. <laughs> Isn't that the news? Is that the news? How about this one? I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. Isn't that social media? I'm just saying Facebook right there. That's Facebook. Isn't it? Oh, it is. Oh, it is. The law has become paralyzed and there's no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. What, did David, what was David looking for? Come on, y'all. This is Saturday night. You got to help me preach, man. Yeah. What was Habakkuk looking for? I want justice. Do something, God. Make this bad stop in this world. Make everyone nice, right? Nobody's yelling here. But let me ask you a question. Could, could, could I or you or all of us take Habakkuk's exact words, rewrite them on a piece of paper right now, date them September 1, 2018, and it would be valid today as it was that day? Absolutely. 
Why hasn't he done anything? 3,000 years now, and no justice? What's wrong with this God? There'll be justice. Do me a favor and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't you, listen, don't you hate when people you know that are wicked seem to flourish? And those of us that are trying to do right seem to struggle? And you're like, why? Why? God, I want justice! And he just doesn't seem to move. And they flourish and flourish and flourish, and we struggle 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. This is the word of the Lord, guys. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will inherit, uh, will, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols, commit adultery, male prostitutes, practice homosexuality, or are thieves, greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive or cheating people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. There will be justice. Notice, it says some of you were once like that. Raise your hand if you were that. Were you, were you those people? I, w- I was that person, right? So that... Some of of us were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's awesome news, right? So you admitted that you were were those things on that list, and and maybe you have a little shame involved with that, but you were honest and open, you said, that used to be me, and so God's word's true. I was like that, but I I was cleansed and made holy, which is amazing Yeah, you were cleansed. On that day that you said yes to Jesus, you were cleansed. Let me ask you a question. Would you jump back in the mud puddle? How many clean people are in mud puddles? I would tell you that there's none. You can't be in a mud puddle and be clean. If this stuff kept you out of the kingdom of God, what makes you think that because one day you went to an altar that you can continue to do that stuff and somehow get in? What kind of foolish teaching teaches that when clearly that's not what the word of God says? Do me a favor and look in Revelation chapter 21, if you don't mind. You don't need to, but I'm going there. I'm going to read it to you. Revelation 21.8, I read it last week, but I want to read it again. Cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers. Listen, don't, don't think that that means that they're sitting in front of a Buddha. Idol worshipers, is, if there's anything or anyone that you exalt and hold in higher regard than you do Jesus Christ, that's an idol. Gator fans, Alabama fans, Patriot fans, fishing fans, leisure fans, vacation fans, picnic fans, SeaWorld fans, Disney fans. We keep going all day and night, right? You exalt that thing above. You give your resources freely and quickly and easily and aggressively towards those things more than you do to the kingdom of God, you got an idol. And he just wants to get it out of you, right? But listen, those people right there, the witch, ones who are, who are practicing adultery and worshiping idols and liars, and well, their fate is in the lake, in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's the second death. There's going to be justice, <laughs> but it's eternal. So we want it now. 3,000 years, God's people have been crying out to Him. I want justice. How much longer will I have to see all this craziness in the streets amongst, will you come down and fix it? And it's still going on today. 
But does that mean there's not going to be any justice? No, justice will be served ultimately in eternity. Listen, nobody's getting away with anything, y'all. No one. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, don't be misled. And see, when it says don't be misled, sometimes when it's taken 3,000 years, we could, be, we could be misled. We start thinking, well, maybe it's just not going to happen. I've been, I've, been, I've been asking God for all this time, and maybe it's just not going to happen. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death. Death is what? Eternal. They will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting. What's that? Eternity. They will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. There is justice eternally. Okay? What's frustrating is that in the Scriptures, and we also know this to be true because we live it, that, the, that God brings rain to the just and the unjust alike, right? And that frustrates us because he or she is rotten and this, and I'm good. <laughs> you're not, by the way. I just want to let you know that. Okay, We're, I'm good. You're not. I'm trying. I'm failing. I'm struggling. I'm just scraping to get by. And this guy over here, he is lying and cheating and stealing and he's got a beautiful house and a nice car and he seems to be doing great. Why is that? Because God brings rain to the just and the unjust alike. That's his decision. That's his decision. But justice comes in eternity. And in Luke 16, it tells us that there will not be a drop of such rain to relieve the burning, dry tongue of the one who was on that, those lists who defied the Lord, who ignored the Lord, who did not follow the Lord, was disobedient to the Lord, did not embrace him as Lord, and he will be in hell forever. Justice will be served. No one can outrun the justice of God. No one can mock the justice of God. Justice will be served. Okay, so... That's eternal, and that's fine, and God's word teaches that, but we're not living in eternity yet, if you will. Like, we're, we're, we're part of the kingdom. If you said yes to Jesus, you're, you're in the kingdom right now. But you're not, like, living in, in forever yet. You're still right here. It's September 1, 2018. I'm still here, Lord. I'm still here. So what about now? Stop the bad guy, Lord, right? Stop the bad guy. Stop the bad country, God. Stop the bullet. Stop the plane. Stop the drought. Stop the famine. Common prayers of the righteous man or woman, isn't it? Let me just say something about drop the famine. Stop the famine and stop the, the drought. <clears throat> There's no lack in God's provision for those people. He's not, you're not, you're not crying out, hey, stop the drought and, and bring rain to Ethiopia. Why won't he answer that? He's in charge of the weather, it says in Job, right? Why won't he change that? Why does he need to? There's no shortage of food. When he gave food to us as humans, he gave us plenty. Do you know that our government pays farmers right around here to let their oranges rot? To make sure the market value of oranges stays high? Do you know what a, a bushel of oranges would, would mean to a, 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 a famine or a drought-laden nation, a village of little kids? They'd tear those oranges up like they were filet mignons. And we let them rot. There's no shortage of God's provision. He has provided. His provision's not the problem. Our system and our program's the problem. We're the problem. And we're calling out to him, I need you to help me. Help them, help them. And that's admirable. Get your fanny on a plane, bring everything you have, and go help the people. Do you know how much it costs to dig a well? 
in Africa to provide clean drinking water for an entire village for like five years? Five grand. Now I look across this room and I know everyone's financial situation because you're my friends. I know all of you. I don't know anyone in here who really has five grand right now. And I'm not, I'm not about to take a love offering, but I guarantee you, we could raise that money in a month and change our entire village's life right now. So has God answered the prayer of his people to, to help the famine and the drought? He's already answered it. His answer was yes. Go. Go bring them the oranges that you rot on the ground to keep your market value up. <clears throat> Stop all these things, God. We want justice. We want justice. We want justice. Stop the bad guy. Stop the bullet. Stop the plane. Stop this. Stop that. What's the highest human virtue? Is it not love? It's love, isn't it? There's lots of things, but isn't love what sets us apart from all other things? Really? I mean, like, butterflies don't love each other, I don't think. If they do, I don't know anything about it. And I don't think tulips love each other. And I don't think little grains of kitty litter are talking to each other, sending each other love letters. And I don't think mountains are, are, are loving each other. And I don't think w seas and oceans and streams. And I don't think stars and puppy dogs and otters and whatever it is that colleges and, and, and teams and universities and hospitals and philosophies and the market, and um, Democrat, and listen, none of those things love. We're unique in that. We get to love, right? Faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest. Love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor. Love one another. Husbands, love your wife. You can help me here. They'll know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. Love is the highest of human virtue, and in God's sovereignty, he has chosen to give us the free will to decide to love another. And in our choice to love another, in our decision to love them, we are called to help the other out of that love, right? But if God, listen, this is the, this is, this is, if God intervenes all the time, I mean, that's what we ask him all the time. Do this, do this, help that, stop that. Please, we need justice, do it. Do. If God does that all the time and he intervenes so that these people or the, this person never experience pain or loss, no untimely deaths, no injustice, can we just toss this thing in the trash? I mean, if he's going to step in, then what's the sense in learning and growing and changing and serving if God's just going to make it all good? It's all good, right? Or is it? I just want you to think about this. Who's good? Is it my good that he should live up to? Because I know my good's different than your good, right? Isn't my good different than yours, Martha? We got different lists. So is it my good or is it, Shanika, is it your good? I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's, um, I know, maybe it's American good. Because we have, we got some, some countries out there we don't like, right? Nuke them, God. Make them a parking lot, God. You see how they're treating people, God, right? Maybe it's American good. Maybe it's Russian good. You know, as, and I love our country, and I'd rather live here than anywhere else in the world. And there's some countries out there that do things I think are absolute wicked and evil, right? But don't you know that those people over there, they think that America is the height of evil and wickedness. So maybe it's their good that, I mean, whose good are we trying to conform the sovereign king of the universe into? Who's good? 
if it's not his good. See, the problem is that he's got all authority. And all authority is divinely his. And so he's decreed, whether you like it or not, that ultimate justice will be served eternally. That's the way he does things. And that might not be your good. It might not be on your list of good. But that's his decision, and it's not yours. And I would just say this. I don't want to jump off this subject without hitting this nail on the head again. If there's injustice in this world, maybe we need to do, a, and this is crazy to hear from a pastor, but maybe we need to do a little less praying that he'll do something, and maybe do a little bit more praying about him empowering you to go do something on his behalf. That's what we need. We are his agents of reconciliation. Do you guys know? Like, Jesus isn't walking around here anymore to, to actually break the bread and the fishes. You are. Right? You are. You are. Right? So he's speaking through you. You're his, he's making his plea through you, the Bible says. Right? Not through him. Through you. His spirit in you. Through you. Speaking on his behalf. Working on his behalf. So... Justice will be served. How about righteousness? What if it is those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? Righteousness, not, not justice like do something for me or something for him or something for us or something for the world, but maybe it's internal. Maybe it's I want to do the right things. I want to be righteous. I want to say the right things. You know, if there's a heaven, I kind of want to go there. I'd like to have God be pleased with me, right? I think that unless you're absolutely wicked, you probably have those thoughts. You're wicked, 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 wicked. You're probably not thinking that. You're thinking about how you could jack up somebody's day. But if you're somewhat well-adjusted, you're thinking, yeah, I want to be a good guy. I want to be a good guy. A lot of people think I'm a good guy, right? I do. Um, back in the day when all this was happening, the, the Jewish leaders at the time, these were the uh, Pharisees, they kept all the rules. They did everything right. You know, it says in Luke 11 that they actually... Like, we, 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 we take our offering, we put the basket around, and people, like, don't like to give anything, right? Because it's, like, infringing upon their comfort level. And those guys were so anal and proper, and pr they, would, they would tithe off of their little spices. Like, if they had a little tree of, of oregano growing in their flower pot on their windowsill, they would break off one leaf for God and nine leaves for me, and then they would do it with paprika and thyme and whatever those other herbs, and right? That's, they did everything right. But they missed the reason for the law. And they completely missed the heart of the God who gave them the law. And that's why you see here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, look what Jesus says. I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. They did everything right. And you have to have righteousness that far exceeds that or else you're not going to heaven. You're not part of the family. Yikes! That's a high water mark. And that's why Paul, who absolutely understood this, and he was a Pharisee, he was one of these guys who kept it, the, the, the rules perfectly, right? He was not a misbehavior in any way according to the law of God. And he said in Romans 3.20 that no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. But listen, this is what he didn't say. He didn't say nobody can ever do right by doing what the law commands. You absolutely can. You can do the right things, but it didn't say that. What did it say? You can't be made right. That's righteousness. Made right. Not just doing the right things, but becoming the right person, right? It's about being the right person in, in, in your, like your body, like, like it says here, doing, right? That's the body. That's physical. Doing the right things, having the right heart, the right motivation, the right, the right attitude, the right priorities, the proper perspective, a biblical worldview rather than a secular one. 
That's what righteousness really is. I want to be a good guy, but I can't even pull off the do the right thing. Right? How many people, honestly, like this is not, this is not to, to be arrogant in any way, just being honest. How many people think that they're a good guy or a good girl? Just raise your hand. I'm a good guy. You think so? Decent? I'm a good guy. Good girl. But you can't even do the, you can't even do the right things, but yet you think you're a good guy. Right? You think you're a good girl, but we can't even pull off doing the right stuff. The Bible says all of us fail in many ways in the book of James, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in Romans. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we claim to have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Just, listen, we can't even pull off doing right, but even doing right isn't real, real righteousness. So what righteousness is Jesus speaking of that exceeds the perfect letter of the law guy? Like, this guy does everything right, and yet I have to be more right than that. What's, how can I possibly do that? Listen, you can't. You can't. Here's perfect righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin, what's that mean? Perfect righteousness. There's been one. His name's Jesus. He never sinned. And I'm not talking about just doing the right things. He never had a bad attitude when he did it. He never had a bad motivation when he didn't do it. He never had a bad attitude and never had a bad motivation, never had the worst bad perspective, never had the wrong priorities. Perfect righteousness. He is the definition of perfect righteousness, right? Not just in action, but in motivation behind the action or motivation to not act. He had it perfect. He who knew no sin became sin so in him you might become the righteousness of God the perfect one became imperfect so the imperfect people could become perfect that's the righteousness that Jesus is talking about that's Jesus Christ on the cross that's what happened right there he became sin so that you could become perfect in God's eyes so when you say yes to this gift and you repent of sin, and you embrace Jesus Christ by faith as Lord and Savior, then you're part of the body, right? You're part of the church. And that means it's a new reality for you. Let me ask you a question. What color is this? Black. What if I don't feel like it's black? What color is it? What if I don't think that it's black? What color is it? So if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. He who, who knew no sin became sin, so that in him the imperfect ones would become the perfect righteousness of God. That's a new reality. That's the truth. It doesn't matter if you think it. It doesn't matter if you feel like it. It doesn't matter about your opinion at all. Guess what your opinion means? Nothing. That's the new reality. That's truth. It doesn't matter if I think this is black or not. I can call it red all day. It doesn't change what it is. It's black. And if you've embraced Christ as your Lord and Savior, then perfect righteousness is yours in the eyes of God. Do you understand? Someone should be clapping up in here. Someone should be thanking Jesus up in here. Are you kidding me right now? I need to sit down. I can't do it. For real, y'all. No one gets excited about that? Where's the real church at? Come on, guys. No one's excited. My Lord. I'll finish. <clears throat> so there's a big gap, though. There's a big gap between perceived righteousness, which is not like fake perceived, but what God sees. That's what he perceives us as. When he sees you, he sees the righteousness and perfection of his son upon you. Perceived righteousness, positional righteousness. When you said yes, you became a son or a daughter of God. You're in, right? You're in, you're in, you're in. But there's a big gap between that and true righteous living, right? And that's why it says that you were, you were, you were once separated from God because of your thoughts and actions, but through Christ's death on the cross, in his physical body, God has brought you into his presence holy, blameless, and without fault. That's awesome, right? 
But yet, the Bible also says, be holy for I am holy. Why? Because he perceives you as perfect. You are perfect in his eyes, but he knows underneath that little umbrella uh, called Jesus Christ, you're still under there misbehaving. And he sees it. Don't be fooled. He sees it. So there's a difference between being positionally righteous. You're in the family of God. But I'm in Christ, but I sure ain't acting like him. Right? You know what I wrote down in my notes? I got too much me in me. That's what I wrote down. I still got too much me in me. Righteousness like Jesus goes beyond actions. It goes to priorities, motivation, attitude. It's all these things. And this is the crossroads right here where happy is decided. You're going to decide right there and then whether you're going to find happiness or not. See, if you start out by searching after Jesus, hot, 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 and you go after him big time. But it tapers off to warm and cool and cool and cold and cold and cold and cold. Well, there's very little happy, happy, joy, joy found there. And you've experienced it, and so have I. And the only ones who will be truly happy are the ones who get satisfied. Right? But you've got to want it. You gotta need it. You gotta go after it. Yeah. God doesn't make it a habit of showing up at someone's house who's lethargic and complacent and fits them into the nooks and crannies of life and reads once in a while, shows up on occasion when there's a special speaker doing a special event. Nothing would be more important than coming and hearing God's word spoken over you so your faith could be built. And you'd have an encounter with God. I, that's what I'm shooting for every single time we come. That you would not just hear me or hear the songs, but you'd hear God speak to you. And what could be more valuable than that? Jeremiah 29, 13 says, If you seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. Hebrews eleven six 6 says that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. 1 Chronicles 28, 9. Worship and serve him with your whole heart heart and with a willing mind the great commandment love the lord god with all your mind heart soul and strength get after him and i think that's why people don't value coming to church or going to a small group or going to pray listen monday i don't know what's going on around here with you guys but it's going to just make it you have to make a choice monday nights used to have 25 plus people in here praying I have five now. What's going on, guys? Is it not important? I'm just here to try to fan the flames of your faith. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm just saying, isn't it important? Don't you think you should come and pray? Right? How about Wednesday night? Everyone said, preacher, order me a book. Order me a book. I bought all these books. No one comes. I don't want to spend 12 bucks on a book. You're not going to use it. Bring it back. You can give it to someone who will. Right? What are you doing at home? Why aren't you coming? We had like six people here Wednesday night. There's usually 30. What's going on? I'm just saying these things to fan the flames of your faith, right? What, what, what's more important? Do you, do you want, when you, when you show up, do you want him to meet you? Do you I, I want him to meet me every time I open my Bible, every time I go on my knees, every time I come up here and strap on my microphone. I'm not here so he can meet you. I'm here so he can meet me. I want to meet him. I just want to encourage you, like, if you're not feeling anything, if you're not enjoying, if you're not having, if you're not being supremely blessed, maybe it's because you're not, coming after him with your whole heart i don't ever think that god's sitting there saying oh he's here to see me <laughs> no. never never what is he doing the service starts at six what time he's here at 5 30 going i wonder if he's coming in now i'm here i'm here i'm here and he's looking at that door come on i want to see you today i want to see you nick come see me Come see me, Gary. I'm right here. Right? All the time. All the time. Never him not showing up. Never. <clears throat> How do we get it? How do we get the righteousness? How do we get the righteousness of Christ so infused into us? It's 
to those who hunger and thirst after it. You know what it doesn't say? This is why we read, this is why you should be reading the Bible and reading it slow. This is the second thing I'm telling you that, that's not what it says. It doesn't say this. It doesn't say you can't do righteous things. It says you can't be made righteous by doing righteous things. And this here says, not the people who are hungry, not the people who are thirsty, but the people who hunger and thirst. It's a verb, y'all. It's a verb. The ones who are, let's go back to Golden Corral for a second. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about when you get up and out of that parking lot and you're going to that door. And you don't care what church members are in front of you, get out of my way, man, I'm going to go eat. Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Those who hunger and thirst, they'll be satisfied. Th listen, you, you can be hungry all you want, but if that hunger doesn't drive you to get in your car and go to the corral, you ain't going to be satisfied. Right? Hunger don't mean anything. Those who hunger, those who have a strong desire or craving for something. I need this. I want this. I'm going after this thing. This desire is so powerful that it drives me to action. Those people will be satisfied and filled with their relationship with God. Those people will have a vibrant relationship with God who say, is it 6 o'clock yet on Saturday? Let's go! Right there, that man. I love him. Because that's the way he comes every single week. I can't wait. He texts me. I can't wait to worship, warrior. I can't wait to worship. What songs are we going to play? You should play this song. I can't wait to worship. That's the way we're supposed to be. And look at when you get here, you know, I, don't want you, I want your eyes on Jesus, but if you ever want to take a second and look at him, dance and go like this, because God is meeting him here, and the rest of us are sitting like this. Because he's, he's hot after God. I want you to be hot after God, once and for all, hot after God. Not phoning it in, not from a distance, not, oh, that'd be nice if I have some time. No. Here's King James says it best, actually, in this one. King James. He says, those who hunger and thirst after God. That's the best translation. Those who are hungering and thirsting. Verb, I'm coming after you. They're the ones who will be satisfied. The others won't want to come. They won't want to serve. They won't want to give. Because they've never seen anything happen from God in their life. And so your invitation to church is, is great, but if they don't experience the presence and power of God, their life here in church is very short-lived. They don't come anymore. Those of us that have experienced investing into his kingdom, and, and I'm not talking about just investing in the basket. I'm talking about time and thought and, you know, effort. I'm serving, I'm giving, I'm helping, I'm praying, I'm attending, I'm encouraging, I'm preaching, I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm seeing results. I see God show up and do something as a result of my investment. You couldn't keep me out of here. Right? You know what I'm saying? I want 150 screaming, raving loons in the seat. Let me take a break. Yeah. Don't come here and listen to me yell. I want to come listen to you yell. You know? Here, do me a favor. Look in uh, Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Here's another picture of this. So awesome. For real, while you're turning there, let's start praying again, man. Let's start praying again. Let's start showing up here on Wednesday nights and let's study the, the word of God together. Let's worship together. Don't just waste 12 bucks on a book that you're going to add to your pile. Use it. Ring, ring out of it all that God would pour into you from it, right? Why would, don't, if not, take the 12 bucks and go to Golden Corral. Be satisfied that way. Here's David again, man. And listen to this. This is the guy who's referred to as the man after God's own heart, right? After God's own heart. The one who's chasing him, pursuing. 
Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. That wasn't the song we just sang. You remember that? God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. This is euphemistic for there's just no place to be blessed like from God. Is there water? Yes, literally. But he realizes that nothing will satisfy his soul. And the longing for this, this thirst and longing, and need, like nothing's going to fill that except God. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. And here, remember I said that those who have invested heavily in and they've seen the return on investment, you can't keep them out of here because they see it. They're like, this is real. I want this. There's nothing like it. Look what he says. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. See, he saw it. I want it. I've seen it. I need it again. Nothing will satisfy. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. Listen, you, can, you could take a pen and, and erase or cross out is better than life itself and put in anything, anything in your life that is keeping you from making Jesus Christ your priority. Cross it out and put that thing in there, and that's what he's saying. Nothing will satisfy like you. Nothing. Nothing. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting my, up my hands to you in prayer. Maybe that's why you see people lift their hands in church. It's not because it's a trendy thing to do. It's actually biblical. Isn't prayer just prayer? Isn't worship music just prayer with, with a melody? Isn't it? That's why they do this. Not because, God, I want you to see me over everybody else. I want you to love me more. I want to be your best friend. No. The word of God says lifting your hands in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. Look at this. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night because you're my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. Turn backwards a few pages to Psalm 42. Do you love God's word? I love God's word. More and more. Psalm 42, look how it starts. Same guy. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O oh God. I thirst for God the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Like, I need you! Seeking, searching, longing, thirsting, hungering after the righteousness of God. This is the one who will have all of the me purged out, and all of the him will increase. Only that person, not the cold, cold, half-hearted, lethargic, complacent, sometimes I'll go, sometimes I'll give, sometimes I'll remember to pray, sometimes I'll help. Yeah, that guy, very little blessing, very little joy, very little fulfillment, very little satisfaction, very little filling from Christ. We're going to be done here in a moment. We're going to worship this Jesus right here, right now. But I just want to say this, that the white, hot pursuit, the longing, the thirsting, the hungering, the earnestly seeking guy or gal. Listen, they find a righteousness infused in them like that of Christ. His or her actions change. 
his or her attitude changes. His or her priorities and perspectives change. That positionally, God stamped them when they said yes to Jesus. And he stamped them and said, you're good. You're my son. You're my daughter. You have heaven eternal. You're in the kingdom. But in practice, when you go after him with your whole heart, then in practice, God actually sees you as righteous. He sees you doing and being and acting and thinking the way he sees you, right? Don't you hate it when you find out you're perfectly behaved children who are such a gentleman and a lady before you find out that they're being rotten in school and all that you thought that they were, they are not, right? Disappointing, breaks the heart of the, of the mother and the father. Guess what? It breaks the heart of your father too. He's done so much to stamp you right. And yet, we go around jumping back in mud puddles all the time. And that, my friends, that's not where happiness is found at all. Can I pray with you?